the MacBook Air. It's become the ultimate ultra-portable laptop. Uh, the M1 shifted our perception of just how much computing power you could put in a thin and light chassis, and when the M2 was released, it moved this on a step further. But for many people, the 13-inch display is just a little bit too small, and lots of folks have been waiting a long time for a 15-inch MacBook Air, and now it's here. Now, a big challenge when you scale up a thin and light chassis like this is keeping that solid feel that MacBooks are known for. Is it possible to increase the size of the laptop without introducing flex? And will this larger chassis help to keep the M2 chip cooler than the 13-inch model? Will we get a little bit more performance? Let's take a look. So we'll start with the obvious differences to the 13-inch model, and we'll answer that question about the build quality, and then I'll give you my first impressions. We're going to dig into the specs, we'll do a few benchmarks, and then we'll draw some conclusions. Now, naturally, this 15-inch feels bigger. My laptop is the 14-inch Pro, and I'm a bit of a fan of smaller laptops, so this does feel quite big to me. We've got a 15.3-inch diagonal screen, and it doesn't have the smallest bezels in the world, so the diagonal measurement of the whole chassis is actually 16.3 inches. Now, for comparison, the 13-inch model has a chassis diagonal of 14.6 inches. So, yeah, probably not an earth-shattering insight there. The bigger model is indeed bigger. Um, but despite this, for a laptop with a 15-inch display, uh, it's pretty light. I mean, it's not going to float off your desk if you don't hold it down, like Apple's adverts might suggest, but at 1.51 kilos or 3.3 pounds, it is a low weight for a laptop in this category. Uh, I looked up the weights of other 15-inch laptops, and I'll pop those up on the screen, along with the 13-inch MacBook Air for comparison and the 14-inch MacBook Pro model. And as you can see, Microsoft's Surface Laptop 5 is pretty close, but generally we're used to 15-inch laptops weighing more than this one does. And I have to say, it feels completely solid. There's no chassis flex at all. Uh, the display hinge has the usual Apple quality to it, and the screen doesn't wobble excessively. Uh, the whole laptop is nicely balanced. If you want to pick it up by the corner, there's no issues in doing that at all. And that's an impressive piece of engineering for something this thin, and probably quite a challenge to overcome for Apple's engineers. Uh, it's one of the reasons, I suspect, why it's taken us a while to see the 15-inch MacBook Air. Uh, Apple wanted to get this right. Now, the keyboard that we've got here is the usual size, and it has the usual typing feel that all MacBooks now enjoy. It's easy to type on, the keys feel good, and there's zero deck flex as you type. It is, of course, backlit, and it has the usual Touch ID fingerprint reader in the power button. The trackpad, though, you'll notice that this makes use of the extra real estate on this 15-inch model, and as a result, it's bigger than the trackpad on the 13-inch, and that might be important to some users. Now, Apple has also utilised this additional space to improve the audio by adding two additional speakers. We've got force-cancelling woofers for better bass response, so overall the 15-inch has a louder and more full sound. The speakers actually sit within the chassis uh, at each corner here, and they bounce the audio off the display back at you, uh, rather than sitting under grills on the side of the keyboard, like on the MacBook Pro models or the original M1 MacBook Air. If you're thinking six speakers might mean sound much like the 16-inch MacBook Pro, you need to temper your expectations. The sound is good, and it is a nice upgrade over the smaller laptop. Uh, speech is very clear, music sounds pretty reasonable, but you're not getting MacBook Pro quality sound here. Even my 14-inch sounds much fuller with deeper bass. But for a laptop this thin, I think it sounds great. Now, the most obvious difference that we have here over the smaller MacBook Pro is the larger display. Uh, many people don't have a desktop computer with a large display anymore. Their laptop has to do it all, so extra screen real estate makes a real difference to productivity. The resolution is 2880 by 1864, and by default it scales to look like 1710 by 1107. Uh, if you need to fit more on the screen, you can scale it to look like 1920 by 1243, which is more than full HD resolution. And likewise, if you need to have your text a bit larger, you can scale it in the other direction. Brightness for the display is very good at 500 nits, but there's no HDR or XDR here. It's a standard LED backlit IPS panel, and it looks fantastic, like Apple's displays always do. And there'll be plenty of PC fans arguing that this should be OLED or it should have HDR or a higher refresh rate than 60 hertz, but Apple knows its target audience, and this is a great display for that audience. It offers excellent brightness and colour accuracy. This one supports the wide colour P3 gamut and can display a billion colours. 
there's True Tone support to automatically match the white balance of your screen with ambient surroundings, if you want to do that. And the resolution is high enough at 224 pixels per inch that you can't see the individual pixels on the screen. I haven't done any scientific testing, but uh, the uniformity of the lighting of the display looks really good to me. And I would personally be happy to use this display for professional video or photography work. Now, whilst we're talking displays, if you want to attach an external display, you can only drive one, which is a little disappointing. Uh, there are workarounds for this, but if you need more displays, you probably need to be looking at the MacBook Pro with the uh, Pro or Max version of the M2 chip. Apple say that that one external display can be up to 6K at 60 Hertz, but they don't specify other resolutions or refresh rates. I have seen the 13 inch M2 MacBook Air running a 4K 144 Hertz external display. So if you want to have a higher refresh rate display, you can do that as long as it's 4K resolution or below. Now my first impressions of this machine are really good. Uh, even though this is the base model with eight gigabytes of RAM and a 256 gig SSD, it feels incredibly responsive to use, and it will easily handle the general computing and content consumption workloads that this sort of computer is typically used for. But it can also go way beyond that, offering productivity and graphics performance that actually makes this an option for some professionals. The build quality is absolutely typical of Apple laptops, and I really quite like this um, starlight finish. The weight and size of it means that it's still a very portable option, but you're getting the benefits of the larger display, the better audio, and the larger trackpad as compared to the 13 inch. And Apple hasn't changed anything else, and perhaps that's a missed opportunity. I'd really like to see this MagSafe port move to the opposite side of the laptop. This would then give you the option to charge via USB-C on one side and MagSafe on the other. And it's nice to be able to charge a laptop from either side. It's one of the things I love about my 14 inch MacBook Pro. And of course, there is Apple's stubborn refusal to make 16 gigs of RAM and 512 gig SSD the default options. We all know why they haven't done it yet, because it enables them to make a huge profit on the upgrade fees and advertise a lower starting price. But in 2023, it just feels wrong that a 1400 pound computer should only come with eight gigs of RAM and a paltry 256 gig SSD. Now the SSD on this entry model has a single 256 gig NAND flash chip, and that means that your SSD performance is going to be about half the speed of larger capacity models. Apple doesn't advertise this or make it clear on their website, and that's not cool in my opinion. Anyway, I benchmarked the SSD using amorphous disk mark and Blackmagic disk speed test, and you're going to be in the range of 1400 to 1600 megabytes per second on this base model SSD. Uh, you can roughly double that performance if you go for the 512 gigabyte model. Now that said, 1400 to 1600 megabytes per second is not slow by any means, and it's more than enough disk performance for the vast majority of users. Where it does potentially become an issue though is when the computer starts to use the SSD to swap system memory, which is something that Apple Silicon Macs tend to do quite a lot, especially if you only have eight gigabytes of RAM. I bought this particular model as a replacement for my wife's laptop. She's got an old dual core Intel MacBook Air, so I don't have any concerns personally with the eight gig 256 combination in this case. This is gonna be more than enough performance for what she's gonna use it for. Uh, internet content consumption, study projects, Microsoft Office, some photo editing, all of those kind of things. So if that's what you need your laptop for, I think you'll be fine with this base model. Now if you do need more storage, you can spec up to two terabytes on the MacBook Air, but be warned, it is not cheap. When it comes to the system memory, you can choose eight gig, 16 gig, or even 24 gigabytes. And if you're planning to use your MacBook Air for some more advanced work, perhaps more of the photo editing, video editing, or coding, then you'll probably see a benefit from selecting 16 gigs. But that does mean that you'll need to order online as the models available off the shelf in store will normally only have eight gigabytes. And if you're wondering whether you should spec up to 24, then the answer is that most people won't see the difference over 16. There is also the cost to consider because by the time you've added a 512 SSD and 24 gigs of RAM, you're pretty much at the price of the 14 inch MacBook Pro through retailers like Amazon. But with the 14 inch MacBook Pro, you also get a better CPU, a better GPU, higher memory bandwidth, three Thunderbolt 4 ports with support for multiple external displays, a mini LED XDR display, better speakers, an HDMI port, an SD card reader, and so on. 
Now true, the display on the 14-inch MacBook Pro is slightly smaller and it weighs 100 grams more, but if you need higher specs, then a 15-inch MacBook Air with 24 gigabytes doesn't really make any sense unless you desperately want the form factor. Uh, let's run through the rest of the specs though and do some benchmarks. Uh, first of all, ports. You get two USB 4 slash Thunderbolt 3 ports, and you can charge the MacBook Air through either of these. And you also get MagSafe 3, and the included cable has a color match connector. Uh, there's a 3.5mm headphone jack on the right hand side, which does have support for high impedance headphones. Uh, when it comes to charging, the MacBook Air supports fast charging through the MagSafe port, providing that you're using a charging plug which delivers enough power. As standard, you'll get a dual port 35 watt charging brick. And just to be clear, that's 35 watts total, not 35 watts for each port. But you can instead choose the 70 watt single port brick for no additional cost, and that one does support the fast charging. The battery in this 15 inch model is 66 and a half watt hours, and Apple are claiming 18 hours of full HD movie playback and 15 hours of wireless web browsing. And that's with the display at the half brightness setting. So unless you are running power intensive apps, all day battery life is a reality with the MacBook Air, so you can do your work without being tethered. Uh, which brings us nicely to wireless. The 15 inch MacBook Air supports Wi-Fi 6 or 802.11ax, so you should be able to get decent uh, connection speeds with that. But there is no Wi-Fi 6E support here, so if you're regularly accessing 6E networks, you're not going to get the best performance. Uh, just to be clear though, most Wi-Fi networks are not 6E at time of filming, so I don't think this will be an issue to the majority of buyers. There are still no MacBook Airs with cellular connectivity options, and that might seem like a bit of an oversight for a device like this, and will probably annoy some potential buyers. Uh, but a lot of people now use their phone as a hotspot. Um, I've got an unlimited data plan that allows me to tether or use my phone as a Wi-Fi network or hotspot. And that kind of contract is pretty easy and cheap to get here in the UK, and it gets around this problem. But I know that uh, it's not the case in other countries, so lack of cellular connectivity might be a deal breaker for some. Completing the wireless connectivity, we've got Bluetooth 5.3. Uh, when it comes to video calls, you're covered by the 1080p FaceTime HD camera. And this can use the signal processor in the M2 chip for computational video effects. Things like blurring the background or improving poor lighting situations. Uh, there's also a three microphone array to handle the audio. Video conferencing is a pretty essential function for many people and the 15 inch MacBook Air is a great solution. Particularly with the upgrades that are coming in macOS Sonoma. Now finally, in our specs overview, we should probably cover the specs of the M2 chip. It is basically the same chip that you get in the 13-inch model, but there is an exception because there's no binned chip option with the 15-inch. We've got eight CPU cores, four of these are low power efficiency cores, and four of them are full performance cores. If you're not familiar with this approach, what it means is that your computer can be far more power efficient. That means longer battery life, but you still have plenty of performance under the hood for when you need it. Inside this laptop is a 10-core GPU. If you buy the base model 13-inch, you get a binned 8-core GPU instead, but that's not the case with the 15-inch. All of the models get a 10-core GPU. And there's also a 16-core neural engine for machine learning tasks, and you get 100 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. Not to mention the various image signal processors, video encoders and decoders, and other specialist components that take the load off the CPU. Uh, it's this combination of things that helps give Apple Silicon its amazing performance and power efficiency. And that is really important in an ultra portable, uh, even a 15 inch model. Let's take a closer look at performance now with some benchmarks. And we'll start with Geekbench 6, where we get a single core score of 2,592 and a multi-core score of 9,986. If that doesn't mean much to you, don't worry about that. I'll give you some more context in a moment. Uh, but Geekbench is a synthetic benchmark, which tests the CPU with lots of different tasks. And these tasks are meant to represent an average person's workflow. So it's a great tool for comparing different generations of the same chip, but it's a less reliable measurement if you're comparing different architectures. Say for example, Apple Silicon with Intel. And that's because different chips are better at some tasks than others. And the system that's right for you will ultimately depend on the tasks that you need to perform. Now that said, it is good enough to give us a general view of performance. And Geekbench 6 includes machine learning tasks in its tests. And those are part of modern computing workflows. Things like clever AI tools in image editors for blurring backgrounds around people or swapping out skies. And remember, the M2 chip has dedicated machine learning cores, so it's really well suited to these tasks. 
older generations of CPUs which don't have these optimizations, they don't tend to fare so well in Geekbench 6. So just for context, let's also give you the Geekbench 5 results, uh, which is 1893 on single core and 8931 on multi-core. That is a very fast single core score. And that's important for a general purpose computer like this one. Single core performance will have a direct impact when you're using complicated web applications or when you're doing general office tasks. So if that's your normal workflow, the M2 MacBook Air has you covered. And multi-core performance comes into play if you do a lot of multitasking or when you're using professional apps, things like Logic, Final Cut Pro, Photoshop, and many more. And this is a very high multi-core score for a laptop at this starting price. To get some context on these results, a few years ago I bought the 15-inch MacBook Pro 2019 model with the top of the range Intel 8-core CPU in it and 32 gigs of RAM. And it costs more than double what this MacBook Air costs. But this MacBook Air offers more than 80% better single core performance and more than 32% better multi-core performance. That is a huge step up in computing performance in a very short period of time. Where now we've got the entry level general purpose computer comfortably outperforming the top of the range professional machine from four years ago. And it does it in a fanless design. Now what's interesting is that the i9 MacBook Pro had a real problem with thermals, and that particular model I spoke about is now a brick because for the second time in its life, it overheated and killed itself, and it doesn't make sense to repair it now. The point I'm making is that whereas that older MacBook Pro couldn't deliver peak performance without blowing its fans at top speed and ultimately dying, uh, the MacBook Air achieves greater performance without even having a fan inside. When it comes to graphics, so you can't really compare the M2 MacBook Air directly with an Intel or AMD graphics card in a benchmark. And that's due to the optimizations of the M2 chip and the way it has access to all the system memory. It can do things that those other cards simply can't. But likewise, when it comes to raw compute performance, those other cards might do better. Uh, let me explain. I ran the Geekbench GPU or Compute benchmark for the Metal Framework and I got a score of 45,466. That's an indicator that it has enough performance to do some gaming with middleweight titles at reasonably high resolutions, and it's plenty enough to handle creative work like photo editing or illustration. If you're more familiar though with the Geekbench 5 numbers, the same test there scores 30,232. Come back to that 2019 MacBook Pro we were just talking about and using as a comparison. Now that had an AMD Radeon Pro GPU in it with four gigabytes of RAM, and it scores 69,000 in the same test, which is a lot more. Now, if you fired up a game on the two machines, you'd see the difference in performance very clearly. But fire up a video editor like DaVinci Resolve and load in some high resolution raw video that requires GPU decoding, and this MacBook Air would wipe the floor with that old MacBook Pro. Now, don't worry too much if these numbers and uh, comparisons don't make much sense to you. I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that for £1,400 or $1,300, this 15-inch entry-level laptop is in many ways much better than the flagship Pro machine of just a few years ago. Let's do another benchmark to answer the other question that I set in the intro. Will the larger chassis help to keep the M2 chip cooler than the 13-inch MacBook Air? Will we get a little bit more performance? To test this, I ran a benchmark using Cinebench R23. This test uses the CPU to render a 3D scene repeatedly for 10 minutes, it gives the CPU a real workout and ensures that it gets plenty hot. And when the CPU gets hot, it has to throttle performance back. Now here you can see the system temperatures before the test. These are pretty normal, uh, though what I would say is that we've got very hot weather in the UK at the moment, and it was high 20 degrees C on the day that I did the testing. When we started the test, after just 20 seconds of running Cinebench, the temperatures inside the computer were north of 100 degrees C, and the throttling begins. But it did manage those temperatures well, and at the end of the 10 minute test, we had a final score of 8,163. Now it's true that the M2 can do a little better than this, but naturally we are affected by the high ambient temperatures on the test day. I asked a member of our team to do the same test on his 13-inch M2 MacBook Air, and he got a score of 8,098. So we can answer our question. Yes, it does seem that the larger 15-inch chassis cools the chip a little better, and you'll get a little more performance. But in reality, you won't see that particularly in day-to-day -day use. It's only gonna be when you really push the machine. Let's just do a few other quick tests before we wrap up. And for these, I'll put the results up on screen, and you can pause if you want to view them in more detail. 
Now we'll start with Blackmagic's raw speed test, which shows how many frames per second the machine can handle at each resolution of Blackmagic raw video. Remember, there are no optimizations for Blackmagic raw video in the M2, like it has optimizations for other types of video. So this is actually a pure CPU or GPU task. The test is free to download if you want to try it on your own machine to compare. For the 8K CPU rendering, we got 25 frames per second and 59 for GPU rendering, which is pretty impressive. Next, I fired up the benchmark in Affinity Photo 2. This is an application that's similar to Photoshop, and it's testing the raster and vector graphics performance of the system. If you want to try this yourself, you can download a 30-day trial version of Affinity Photo, and once you've got the app open, you'll find the benchmark in the Help menu. Uh, you can see here we got a combined CPU score of 800 and a combined GPU score of 12,981. Now those are really good results, and it's fair to say that Affinity Photo is going to run very nicely on the 15-inch MacBook Air. Now finally, let's run the web benchmarks from browserbench.org. And again, you can run all these on your own machine for comparisons. And if you spend a lot of time using web apps, then these tests might be quite relevant. We start with Jetstream 2, which tests JavaScript performance, which is very pertinent to complex web applications. And we got a score of about 311. Next, we tried MotionMark, which is designed to test your computer's ability to render graphics in your browser. So if you play online games or if you use Office apps in your browser, this is going to be important. We got a score of 3,777. And finally, we have Speedometer, which measures the responsiveness of web applications, and our score here was 415. So, conclusions then. Uh, I've given some of my thoughts as we've been going through the review, but ultimately the conclusion that I have to draw from this is that Apple are going to sell a lot of these laptops. And with good reason, because this much performance at this starting price with Apple's build quality is very difficult to argue with. Now, as with all Apple computers, prices increase dramatically as you start to add upgrades to the specification. We'll perhaps look at doing a buying guide as a separate video, but I think it's fair to say if you just need a 15-inch general purpose laptop, the entry-level MacBook Air 15-inch is going to meet your needs. This is a great addition to the Mac lineup, uh, but tell me, what do you think of this new machine? Do you think Apple's hit a home run here, or are there things that they could still improve about this laptop? Please let me know in the comments section, and also if you feel the need to vent about Apple's pricing strategies and upgrade costs, that's absolutely fine. I hope this video was useful to you. Thanks for spending a bit of your time with me today. I really appreciate it and all the support that you give to the channel. Hope to see you again soon for some more geekery.